All right, I think we are broadcasting on both places today. Good morning. I think I'm getting the hang of this. God bless each and every one of you this morning. We're so glad that you could be here and joining us for this broadcast. Amen. What a blessing it is to be with you this morning. Yeah, my name is Henry Falcone and from Flame of Fire Ministries. And uh, what a blessing it is to join with you this morning, be with you. Um, got my heater on in my room, my little heater, because it's a little chilly out here in Florida. I think it's like 41 degrees. And warm up, I'll probably be sweating by the time the end of this broadcast comes. But anyways, what a blessing to be with you this morning. Um, good morning, Katie. Good morning, Carrie. Glad that you could join us this morning. It is truly a blessing to be with each and every one of you. Oops, sorry. Yeah, there we go. I just got to put the volume on mute here. There we go. This way I can see your comments. I think I, I've even figured out how to see your comments come up quicker and easier. So praise God, I'm learning. You know, this has been a, a journey for me in this uh, tech techie stuff. And uh, I'm just grateful for my son helping me, you know, to be able to understand it and learning how to work it and put it together. So uh, praise God, amen. Father, we just appreciate you this morning. We love you. We adore you. What a blessing it is to be here with you, Lord, and with your precious ones. You said many are called, but few are chosen. Few will pay the price, and thank you for allowing me to be connected with the few. And that as a few, Lord, we come before you. Lord, our prayer today is that we would know you. And we cry, teach us your ways, O God, that we might know you. That's our desire, Lord. We want to know you. Dwell with you. Live with you. Work with you. Abide in your love and that your love would abide in us. Lord, that the world might see that we're your disciples by the love that we have one for another. The world may see that you have sent us as you sent Jesus by the love that you have for us. I thank you for making us a new wineskin and helping us understand what that is. And today, Lord, that, that as new wineskins, we can drink your new wine as you're revealing the substance of what your new wine is for this age and for this hour. Lord, to stand in this hour that's upon the earth right now, even in our nation, we must be a new wineskin. We must have the new hard drive of your kingdom age. We must drink the new wine of your kingdom, which is your software, your updates, your applications, Lord, so that we can function together with you as an end time people, as full grown sons and daughters of the Lord, as a wheel within a wheel, that you can manifest your glory and your love and transform these kingdoms of this earth into the kingdoms of our God in Christ. We appreciate you so much, Lord. And we thank you for manifesting Lord, I thank you for your manifested presence and everyone that watches this broadcast. I ask you to protect it, to watch over it, Lord. That your Holy Spirit, your angels, will keep us connected. Lord, and today, Lord, that you would take this broadcast and bring it to whom you will. You know how to send it. You know how to bring it. You know how, how people can find it, Lord. And we just lay it into your hands that it will reach the right people, Lord. You're not sending me to everybody, but you're sending me to those, Lord, that you're sending me to. Those that have an ear to hear, eyes to see, hearts that want to understand what you're saying, Lord, to them and to us. So I thank you for that, Lord. To you be all the glory. For I know you do exceedingly beyond, Lord, whatever we could ask or think. And we give you all the honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Lynn. Good morning, Katie. Good morning, Joy. God bless you. If you're joining us for the first time, let us know where you're from. We appreciate it. You know, we'd like to know if you're from a, what state you're from and what country you're from. And uh, don't worry, I'm not going to send you 27,000 emails about supporting our ministry and work. You know, I don't do that. You know, um, for me, it's about relationship, you know, and covenant. And God, God, to God who's, as God knits us to the correct body parts together, 
you know, to those we share with one another, that information and, you know, whatever it is that we need to share with one another out of the love of one another. I have no desire to build a church or a ministry in the, the ways that we've done it in the past, but God asked me to do one thing, to establish the kingdom of God in men's hearts, and that's what I'm trying to do on this broadcast by His grace. He asked me to bring them, bring them to me, He said, and that's what I try to do is to point you, perhaps help you, as God is helping me, as God is teaching me how to find Him, how to know Him. I think I, I think I shared with you some of my favorite scriptures are from Proverbs 8, 17, and 21. You hear me quote them all the time. But the Lord says, I love them that love me. And those who seek me early and diligently, they shall find me. I love that, don't you? That God loves those that seek him. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's what Hebrews 11 says. And then in verse 21, he says, to those I love, I cause them. I love that. I cause them to inherit. And that's what I believe these broadcasts are about, to, that God can cause us to inherit true riches, the true spiritual riches of the kingdom that transforms our lives, transforms our families to come in perfect obedience and alignment with God and his purposes of why we're created. Those are the true riches. And then he says, I fill their treasuries. And that's really important because when God fills our treasuries, then we have enough to give to others. And how many of you want that? You want to have a spiritual substance left over that you can give to others. Amen. Good morning, Viola, Katie, God. Thank you for joining this morning. That's what we desire. I just want you to know, I think there's some of you, by the way, before I forget, that have been um, um, really, I think, being knitted together with us and us with you, and you have prayed for us, and you've encouraged us, and, and, and you have sent financial support, and we really appreciate that so, so, so much. And that support has come out of a relationship not ask, asking me to take an offering now or at the end of the broadcast. The only reason why I even post the ways to do that is people have asked me, how can I? And so, and you know, and as missionaries, we, we so appreciate it. We, we live on it. And um, I want to thank you uh, for responding. Don and I thank you for responding. And just to let you know that your, your seeds that you've been sowing have been so perfect and on time. I mean, there have been certain bills that I needed to pay. And over the last week or so, someone has sent a gift at the right moment to take care of that. I've been so blessed by the Lord and so blessed by your obedience to the Lord. Thank you so much. Because as missionaries, this is how we live. And like I said before, with Christmas and it, you know being a very difficult time for missionaries, um, your doing that has been such a blessing. I just want you to know how timely it was. And I have sent out thank you letters, but if you don't send me your email when you send a donation, I can't thank you personally. And I love to do that because I, I really believe it's, if you took the time personally to pray for me, you know, or my family or for this work or to encourage us, I want to respond to that, you know, to you because, you know, you've taken the time to do that for us. May the Lord give me the time to respond back to you. So I try to send out thank you letters and emails to let you know um, how much we appreciate that. So if you didn't get an email from me, um, it's probably because I don't have your email address. Okay, so if you want to correspond with me and want me to respond to you, even if you sow a seed, please put your email address on there. And I, I promise you I'm not going to send you a thousand letters, okay, and bombard you. I won't do that. <laughs> okay, is that all right with you? Amen. <laughs> Praise God. You know, but I will thank you. I hope that's okay. And if you don't want me to thank you, just let me know on the email. Say, please don't thank me. So, um, but I'd like to release a blessing, you know, from the Lord upon those that pray for us, encourage us, and you know, I've done that, but boy, how timely you have been, and thank you so much, and we appreciate it, and we're praying, you know, for you, and each and every one of you, that God would bless you, and continue to multiply you, amen. I will mention it at the end of the broadcast, uh, so that people who are joining for the first time, if God touches them, notice I said if God touches them, and they want to do that, we, you know, we so appreciate when God touches people on our behalf. Amen. We're not trying to build monthly supporters. You don't hear me saying that. You don't hear any of that. Matter of fact, everything on our website and this ministry is free. You know, it's copyrighted. So I do ask you just to ask me, you know, but we want you to use the materials to teach others. If, they, if, you, if they're a blessing to you, we want the books to be a blessing to you, the music to be a blessing to you and that you can use uh, for that. So um, freely you receive, freely give. But thanks again from the bottom of my uh, bottom of our hearts, and we thank you for remembering us. Thank you. 
Now today, yesterday I shared with you uh, about the Mount of Transfiguration and about the substance of that new wine and what happened on that Mount of Transfiguration. So I'd like to go back and start there today in Mark chapter 9. There is such a presencing of the Lord in this room with me this morning. Um, as I met, as I get up in the morning and just wait in the Lord. And one of the things um, I, I learned from my spiritual father is, you know, and I try to practice this as much as possible, is that when I come, I just sit in my chair and I put up my hands like this and I just wait for him. And I acknowledge him. I acknowledge his presence. I thank him and I let him know how much I appreciate him. And I tell him those words I appreciate because, you know, I, you know, why do you say I appreciate you? Because to me, that's the highest form of love when you can appreciate the value of something or someone. You know, I love my wife, but I appreciate her greatly because I love her value because she adds so much to my life, my ch children, and I appreciate them. And you, all of you, I appreciate you. You don't have to be on this broadcast. You don't have to stand with us and pray with us, but I appreciate you because you're extending yourselves, you know? And what appreciation does is you value the people. You value whatever is given to you, you know? And that's why when people send love seeds, it's not, I know that's just not a nothing. When they pray for you, that's not, that's just something. They're sowing part of their life. If they're praying for you, encouraging you, or sowing at your life, that you, we must learn to appreciate it. You know, I think, you know, in, in the church age, we, 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 we just, we do things, and, but we don't appreciate and cherish and love. You know, one of the things Jesus says, and Paul writes in Ephesians, it says, husbands, love your wives, cherish her as Christ cherishes the church. See, that cherishing is what I, uh, that is what I call appre appreciating. And if we want to drink of the new wine and become a new wineskin, we've got to appreciate the Lord. I mean, agree with me. You got to appreciate. He doesn't have to come. He doesn't have to manifest himself. something. He only comes where he's welcomed. He only comes where he opens up the doors. Those who open the door and want him. I love them that love me, you see. I love them. See, that's an appreciation. The Lord, when he says, I love them that love me, he's letting you know how much he appreciates you. And because he appreciates you so much that you desire to love him of your own free will, he says, to them, I'm going to, they're going to inherit true riches and I'm going to fill their treasuries. So when I, when, when I sit alone with the Lord, I let them know, let the Lord, let him know how much I appreciate him. And then I pray that prayer of David, search me, O oh God, and try me. Know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me because I don't want to approach the Lord without a repented heart, without a broken heart, without a contrite heart. I don't want to assume that I'm right with the Lord. So if there's anything that maybe I grieved him or quenched him with, I want the Lord to show me that. I want to repent right then and there and receive his forgiveness and mercy so that I can approach the throne of grace, right? In my time of need. And once that's done, I just wait and I try to be still. And I, I, I don't try to do a lot of talking because what I'm doing is I'm teaching you how to drink the new wine today as I've been taught how to drink the new wine. I, it's like, if you could see my room right now, you know, and, um, you know, and uh, I don't know if I can show it to you, but anyways, if you could see my, 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 this is my prayer room, my office. This is, I have a room set apart for, for me and the Lord. And when I come in, I actually shut the door to the room and it's shut right now. And when I sit in the Lord, I expect him to open that door and come in. That's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for the Lord to come. So I take on this posture of like this and I close my eyes and I wait. And yes, my mind gets very cluttered sometimes and I just say, mind be still. I'm just here for you. And then for me personally, you know, I, I, I speak to the Lord and I say to him, Lord, I'm here. And if I don't need to hear anything, I don't need to see anything. I don't need to know anything. It is just enough to be with you. And Lord, if you don't say anything, you don't do anything, I'm here. I'm here. And oftentimes I say, the Lord, Lord, if this is where I could stay, Lord, I don't ever want to love the work for you or what you use me for to ever take your place. I would rather do nothing if it meant losing you 
and losing my consciousness of you and losing the reality of loving you. I'd rather do nothing if that something that you have me to do takes me away from you. And I mean that. And I hope you mean that too. I mean that with all my heart. Because, you know, ministry can never take the place of God. We were created for the Lord. We are created for his purposes. We are created for his plans. Good morning, Heather. God, good morning, Gloria. Viola, God bless you this morning. And so I never want the work of the ministry or anything to be above the Lord in my heart. And I believe that's what the new wineskin is made of so that you can drink the new wine because the new wine is going to bring forth the revelation of Jesus Christ in your life as he wants to reveal himself in you and to you. And in the revealing of himself in you, not only does he come to change you, but he destroys the works of the devil and he ignites your destiny. He ignites your purposes. He ignites your plans. Now, does that mean I don't want to be used by the Lord? No. It means that I want to love the Lord first, above all things. And if the choice for me between the Lord being with him or doing something with him, you know, or for him and with him, if there's a choice between those two things and I had to have one over the other, my first choice is to be with him. Maybe that sounds selfish to you, but... I don't think it is because that's why we were made. We were made for his pleasure. We were made for his purposes. In the church age, we have become mission-based. Um, we have become first, I think. And I think we become purpose-driven instead of God, God-led. I don't want to be purpose-driven. I want to be spirit-led. Those that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I want to be led by the Spirit. Whatever the Lord desires out of that relationship of oneness with him, if it's to go to, like I believe he's sending me to, uh, to Pennsylvania, or if it's to go to Africa, like he sent me to South Africa, or if he sends me to my neighborhood Walmart, it doesn't matter. His will matters. His plans matter. His purposes matter. And I may go to Walmart for no other reason just to get groceries, you know, to feed my family. Can't I rejoice in that? Can't I rejoice in the fact that he's given me a supply so I can go to Walmart and buy the groceries I need for my family? You know, I'm not looking to do something, but I desire to become something. And what do I desire to become? The bride. You know, the bride makes herself ready. The Lord chooses his bride out of the daughters, out of all the church. I know people teach that the whole church is a bride. That is just not true. Song of Solomon tells us it's not true. He chooses a bride out of the daughters of Jerusalem, a people within a people. The bride made herself ready for him. There, there'll be attendants. There'll be people who will come to the marriage of the supper of the Lamb. They'll be able to watch, but they won't be the bride. He's coming to prepare to himself a bride without spot, without blemish, and without wrinkle, a glory-filled people, a glorious church. But many are called you were chosen. I believe Matthew 25 testifies of that, that, of the 10 virgins. We know five are wise and five are foolish. And at the midnight hour, it says, behold, go out, meet the bridegroom. Who's able to go meet him? Everybody. Virgins doesn't speak. That parable is not about the lost. Virgins are never identified in the, in the Bible as the lost, the virgins of the church. So you see, there's a people who are wise and a people who are foolish, a people who are ready to people who are not. God is, God is, I think God is enabling me to reach those who want to be prepared, that want to be wise, you know, that want to go in and be able to enter through that door. You know, the, what, what do the wise have? They have something different than the foolish. They have the extra oil in their lamp. And that's what these broadcasts are about, to get the extra oil of the lamp so that we can see the Lord, know the Lord, so that we can become the new wineskin and drink the substance of that new wine. And if you are the wise virgin, you go beyond that, behind that door and you're able to drink the new wine of the, of the kingdom. And that new wine allows us to understand and cooperate and work with God in his end time purposes. That's why the kingdom age message is so different than the church age message. The church age message is a message of salvation. And thank God for that. 
and being baptized with the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. We all came from that. But the 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 king the the, the church age message goes from the book of from uh, Matthew to the to the to to uh, Jude to the last book of Jude. Or, or is it Jude? Yeah, yeah, it's Jude. Jude's the last book. The church age, the kingdom age begins in the sixty six Bible, sixty six book, a completely different book, put at the end of the Bible, that explains the secrets and the mysteries of God's finishing work in your life, in his people, Revelation 1 through 5, and then how the Lord is going to transform the kingdoms of this earth and the entrance of a seventh day, the millennial kingdom of the Lord. We know there's going to be another prophetic day of a thousand years. We know something's going to happen after that, seven years, that thousand years. The enemy's going to be let out for a little time, and then he's going to be thoroughly, totally annihilated, and everybody, after that, whatever happens after that thousand years, you know, there'll be a final completion of a new earth, a new heaven, not a new planet, just a completely transformed earth by the pure holy love of God and the pure. And I believe at the end of the seventh day, you know, after tasting the day of the Lord, I guess there's one more choice for people to decide whether they want the rule of Christ or not, the rule of God or not. I don't understand it. I just, that's all I'm reading in there. But we know that when that's finished, the Lord comes down. The Lord establishes his permanent government in Revelation chapter 22 where that bride comes down as a new Jerusalem city God's governmental reign and in that governmental reigning people that that new Jerusalem city there's no need for a sun or a moon because the Lord's light will be everywhere and in that day he says I will be a God to them and he they shall be my people that's the finishing that's the completion and the book of Revelation is the finishing work of the Lord Remember, on the seventh day, he entered it and he rested from all his works. Now we are receiving the unfolding resting of the Lord. And that unfolding rest of the Lord is to change us from a church-age wineskin to a kingdom wineskin. From, from drinking church-age wine to drinking kingdom wine. And so this new wine gives us, you know, good morning, Greg. God bless you. Thank you for joining. Heather, God bless you. Amen. This kingdom wine... And this kingdom wineskin is our ability to function with the Lord as a wheel within a wheel, as a people within a people. Ezekiel saw that wheel within a wheel. Joel saw it as the army of the Lord. It says, the Lord utters his voice before that army. And great are those, great is that army that's able to execute those words, execute them, which means release them upon the earth. Psalm 149 says that the, that the, that the Lord is going to have a people that are going to be shouting upon their beds, singing, you know, you know, and they're going to be able to bind the kings and nobles with betters of irons, and they're going to execute the judgments that are written. They're going to execute the words of the Lord as God decrees them. That's an overcoming people. That's a bride. That's a church within a church. That's the full-grown sons and daughters of God. They're giving the ability because they're living with the Lord in that third heaven, that glory realm. And that glory realm is filming and filming them day by day. They're drinking the new wine so that they have the understanding, the wisdom, the timing, the functionality of the Lord of glory, the King of glory living in them as a witness. And then the end's going to come. They're going to preach the gospel of the kingdom as a witness. What witness? The witness of Jesus. Their lives are going to be so saturated with Jesus that they're going to be filled with the glory and surrounded with that glory, the per parousia, that new wine. They're going to be filled and surrounded with that parousia so that they are functioning in complete oneness with the Lord as a bride with a bridegroom, as a son with his father, demonstrating the complete victory of Jesus' life being seen in their life. Our life becoming the complete reflection of the Lord's life. This is not everybody. This is those that I overcome. Those that, that accept the preparation of Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. They're, they're lifted up in Revelation chapter 4, positioned. Revelation 4 and 5 is about positioning, about being finished, about being formed. Revelation 5 uh, verses 8, 9, and 10. And, and, and our testimony, a singing testimony that he's chosen us out of every tribe and every nation. And he's purchased us with his own blood. And he has formed us. See, that's exactly where we are now. He's, he's formed us into what? Into a kingdom. He's forming us into a kingdom, a, ro a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a kingdom of kings and priests unto God. Priests, we're being priests and kings because our priestly ministry is our ability to minister to the heart of God. 
to hear God, to bring offerings of righteousness to the Lord as in Malachi chapter 3. We're now able to bring the Lord offerings of righteousness because we're back to our restored place. And then it says, and now as kings, we can rule and reign with him. That's their singing testimony. They can rule and reign with him. God bless you, Bishop. God bless you, Sister Carolyn. Thank you for joining today. We are positioned to rule and reign with him by his end time third day work. The glory, the miracle. How's the Lord doing it? John chapter two, at the end of the church age, the wine is run all out and the Lord has to make new wine. And notice he doesn't use grapes and he doesn't use feet. There's no human effort in making this, there's no human effort in making this new wine. The, 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 Mary says to the servants, do, ex listen, Jesus, Mary comes to Jesus and said, there's no more wine. And Jesus answers her, the most bizarre statement. He says, woman, this is John chapter two, said, why are you bothering me now? My time has not yet come. What was he talking about? It wasn't time to show himself in his miracle power yet, but yet he still does a miracle. This is a prophetic miracle. It's a prophetic picture of how the Lord's gonna finish us on the third day. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana. We are now in that transformational marriage supper of the Lord. Revelation 3.20. We're standing at the, he's standing at the door and he's knocking. And if any man opens that door, he's coming in in a new way. He's revealing himself as the king of glory to finish us, complete us, and marry us. And that's glorious. And in that marriage, as we sup with them, our nature of what we were in the church age, water, is now being changed into kingdom age, wine, water to wine. Not only are we becoming that new wine, but we're able to drink that new wine to fill our this earthen vessel with that new wine as a new wine skin. That's why you can't put new wine into what? An old wine skin. The new wine skin of the kingdom age and the new wine is a drinking with the Lord, a supping with the Lord that not only fills you, but it surrounds you with the parousia, the surrounding of the Lord, the presencing of the Lord. And I've been talking about that for the last couple of weeks, and I'm going to end this week with it. With, with, I'm going to end this series with it. And if I can't get to get it all to it, well, then that's all right. There'll be another time. But the surrounding of the Lord is so critical because we're surrounded by his glory. We're filled with his glory, and we're surrounded with his glory. And that is a state of being. That is a state where the Lord desires us to be filled with the glory. That state of being is what Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied in chapter 60. Arise, go up, and shine. The church age flows on the horizontal plane, and it can only go forward. Revelation, the book of Revelation, is no longer about us going on this plane of horizontal ministry, of the Great Commission as we've known it to be. The Great Commission is going to be taken up into a much deeper place in Revelation. The Great Commission is changing and becoming full. Will souls be saved? Absolutely. Will we be making disciples in the nations? Absolutely. But the position is changed, the function is changed, and the way God is going to do it on the earth is changing. The, the preaching of the gospel of salvation has come to its comes to its fullness. So now the fullness of the preaching of the kingdom, which includes being saved, but also being finished, is the gospel of the kingdom, God's completed work. That's why it's so important for us to understand Revelation chapter one, why Jesus doesn't reveal himself to John, you know, as hey, when he hears the voice of Jesus as a war trumpet, he hears it differently. Why John? John was a beloved of the Lord. If anybody should have known Jesus and recognized his voice, wouldn't it be John, the one that put his head here? Wouldn't it be? But when John hears this voice, he doesn't recognize it. It's a voice, it's a voice calling. See, that's really key. It's a voice calling. It's a, vo a voice today that's drawing us. It's calling us upward, come up here. It's not telling us to go forward without coming up here first. We are going to advance the kingdom of God and go forward. But as a functioning, full-grown sons and daughters of God, sons of God, 
as a wheel within a wheel, connected with the four living creatures, connected with the seven spirits of God and the seven eyes, connected with a with a river that flows from the throne of God, with that that flow that that the twenty four elders, the twenty four thrones, the angels, a myriads of angels, the just the souls of just men, the great cloud of witnesses, all that's in that glory realm with God that's there now. We are to function with them together on earth as it is in heaven. And so the great commission gets completed by the transformation of us coming out of the church age into the kingdom age, by becoming a kingdom wineskin, drinking the new kingdom wine so that we function as one with the Lord, so that the Lord can knit us together, each part supplying what the other has. We become one with the Lord as a bride with a bridegroom. And then we become one with one another as sons and daughters of God bridegroom. We become a multi-membered bride, bride. We become a multi-membered body of Christ, fully connected to the headship in the lordship of Jesus. As Jesus was fully connected to the Father, so will we be connected with the Father through him, in him, with him, and his glory shall be seen upon us. We're going to rise and shine for what the light the light of the revelation of Jesus as the King of glory has come. That's what Isaiah is prophesying. That's what Psalm 24 says. Lift up your head, O ye gates. Lift up your head, O you everlasting doorways. And let who? The King of glory come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, strong in battle. Notice he's appearing to us as the Lord of hosts. That is so key to understanding the new wineskin and drinking the new wine. That he's appearing to us as the Lord of hosts because he's going to utter it utter his voice before his army because he's forming Joel's army right now because they are the ones that are going to execute the word of God upon this earth. They're the ones that the Lord is going to speak with a double edged sword out of his mouth, the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning as in Isaiah chapter four, verses one through four. First, he's going to beautify us, complete us, and then he's going to pitch his canopy over us, his glory over us. His glory is going to be seen in us and be seen risen upon us, hallelujah. That's a position, that's a divine position. That's Zechariah chapter three, when Joshua gets the changing of those garments, when he removes those filthy garments, he's clothed with God's Shekinah garments. And those Shekinah garments, those glory garments, give him a place to have access with God in his courts, to rule from up here in the third heaven, to rule and reign with, and to hear, see, and understand the activity of heaven that must be released upon the earth. That is what the parousia is. That's what the new wine brings. That's why we need the new hard drive of the kingdom wineskin to be able to understand the secrets and the mysteries of the kingdom. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, he's, the disciples asked him, why do you teach, teach the people in parables? He says, he says, to them I speak in parables, but to you I speak the secrets and the mysteries of the kingdoms. Because I speak to them in parables because they have eyes to see and they don't see. They have ears to hear and they don't hear. They have hearts to understand and they don't understand. Their hearts have grown fast. But to you, I speak the secrets of the mysteries of the kingdom. That's why there's a kingdom people. And the kingdom people have the understanding of that tribe of Issachar anointing that's in the new wine so that they can understand rightly the times and the seasons of the Lord, of who God is using, who God's not using. They can understand the change of day. They can understand the tame assign, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the changing of leadership and assignments. That tribe of Issachar gives that day-to-day -day understanding of what the will of God is so that we know exactly what the Lord desires so that this day does not come upon us unaware. It doesn't come upon us like a thief in a night. We enter into that place of Revelation 4.1 where it says, come up here so that I can show you the things that are going to come hereafter. The kingdom wineskin is a kingdom hard drive to contain the information, the strategies, the blueprints of what you need, what I need for my life, for your family, for your church, and for your ministry. And if we don't begin to teach people about the new wineskin and how, and how the Lord makes that new wineskin or how to teach them to drink the new wine, we'll never be able to function with the Lord as his end time army. Praise God. As Joel's army. That requires, I love them that love me. 
and those who seek me early and diligently shall find me. If I could encourage you this morning, if it would be possible, if you could just maybe wipe off your schedule, pastor or leader, block out a week where you're just alone with the Lord and you just lift up your hands and you wait and you lay the ministry, the present work, your family, your life, your finances, and you don't have to be a minister to do this, at the foot of Jesus and say, Lord, I'm not touching this. I want the new wineskin. What needs to end, let it end. What you want to continue and bring into the higher realm of your kingdom, let it let it remain. But I give you permission to remove everything from my life, everything that I'm doing. I don't want to function anymore in the church age or the church age wineskin or the church age drinking of the wine. I want the new. Behold, you do a new thing, Lord. Can we not perceive it? Despise not the day of new beginnings. Praise God. How many of you want that? How many of you desire that? If you're a five-fold ministry, do you realize what you do? Because not only are you laying your life down, but you're laying those that God has entrusted to you at the feet. And now you're allowing the Lord to take you up into a higher realm of glory, a higher realm of understanding. So what? So that you can feed God's people the true word of the Lord for this hour. You can prepare them. Instead of trying to get them saved and unbackslidden every week, you can prepare them for what's coming. Isn't that what the Lord would desire, that we prepare a people for that glory, that they're prepared, that they're positioned, they're propelled, they're, they're, you know, that they're battle ready, that they, have the, that they have the new armor for this day and this hour, the new, the new weapons so that they can stand, that they can know the Lord from themselves, that they can hear God, know God, understand what he wants for their lives and purposes. Shouldn't we prepare them, beloved? If it's just about working, and if we continue in the church age like this, where the loss becomes our priority, do you realize? Yes, I understand the Lord came to seek and save that which I lost, but that's not first. The two, first two commandments, the first commandment is not to win the loss. The first commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, mind, and strength. And then to love your neighbor as yourself. We can't love and reach a world when we deserted the Lord and abandoned our first love. We can bring them a gospel that's preached in our flesh and charisma. And we may even get them intellectually saved, but the reality of the kingdom may never touch their lives because we've given them an intellectual gospel instead of the power of the gospel that changes and transforms them into kingdom people. Just a thought. This kingdom wineskin and this new wine positions us to receive instructions and blueprints of the Lord. God wants to share with us his end time purposes and plans and he wants to flow through you, connect you with the right body parts. That may cause you to move from where you are and may cause you to leave your job because he may want you to be connected with, with, uh, with Bishop Ronald. I have never met Bishop Ronald, but he's been watching the broadcast and, and God bless him, amen. And I believe that he's a kingdom man that desires the things of the kingdom. But what if God needs you to go to, to, to be connected with my brother Bishop or Pastor Roach up in New York? Maybe, why? Because what they have is, and what you have fits together. Are you willing to leave your state of Minnesota? I don't even know where Bishop is, but wherever you are, Bishop, you know, would they leave where, 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 where they are and come and be connected with you? And, and, and as a bishop, would you welcome them knowing that God would send them to you to be connected for his end time purposes? Amen. And as leaders, could we come together? Would there be a desire in me and Bishop and maybe Pastor Roach or Apostle Eddie say that we begin to see we need to come together. We need just to come and just fellowship in the Lord and worship him and praise him. And I just feel connected with you and you feel connected with me and, and we come together. And what do we do? We seek the face of God together and we listen to God together. But you see, one of the reasons why we don't do that often in our apostolic meetings and our, our prayer, we spend very little time waiting on the Lord because we have been so trained by working, we don't know how to wait. They that wait upon the Lord, Isaiah 40, they that wait upon the Lord shall what? Change and renew what? Their strength. 
And as we're changed and renewed by God, this is why it's so important to spend quality time with the Lord. That's why I said I just wait and I don't say anything. And I let the Lord know that he doesn't have to do anything. And there are times I don't feel a thing. That doesn't mean God didn't change me. That doesn't mean that God's substance wasn't deposited in me. It's just that he didn't choose to tell me what it was, but he chose to deposit with it, with it, deposit it within me and it will come out when it needs to come out. It will manifest in my life when it needs to come out. I don't need to know everything. I don't need to see anything. I just need to know what I need to know. <laughs> Middle Georgia. Well, we're not too far apart, Bishop. Praise God. Amen. I'm on the panhandle here in, in the, uh, near Pensacola. God bless you. Praise God. Georgia's right above us. <laughs> Amen. So is Alabama. I think half of us is over Alabama and half of us is, is Georgia's above us. Amen. Thank you, Lord. But this is a day of connecting with the Lord and one another so that God can form us into a kingdom. Amen so that we can function together as a kingdom people. And we are knitted together in that desire for the Lord, that passionate in love with the Lord. I don't want to lose my in love with the Lord ever. What do I have left? What do you have left if you lose our in love with the Lord relationship? And that's exactly what happened at the end of the church age. The church at Laodicea lost its first love, and yet their works are numerous and even greater than when they started. They even tried those who say they were apostles and are not. And you would have thought that would have been enough. But Jesus said to them, nevertheless, I have this one charge against you. You've deserted me. You've abandoned the love that you had for me at first. He doesn't stop there. Do you know what he tells them? Repent and consider the heights you've fallen. Wow. And do your first work and return to your first love. You've got to protect that first love relationship because it's that first love relationship that the Lord is taking today and changing you from water to wine. It's that absolute love for him and in love with him that gives him that water substance to change into new wine, fit for the kingdom purposes, fit so that God can trust you with his true power and true authority and true dominion so that you can subdue the earth. So that God can use you to speak to kings and release words of consequences and words of judgments to transform the kingdoms of this earth into the kingdoms of our God in Christ. So that he can share with you the secrets and the mysteries. He wants to reveal you. He wants you to be warned. He wants you to be forewarned. He wants you to know the things that are to come. That's why you got to be sober and vigilant and ready, prayerful, seeking the Lord. I don't want to work for the Lord. I want to rest in the Lord. The seventh day is the rest of God. We cease from our efforts. We put off our, our wool garments so that we don't sweat in the glory realm of God. No sweat can enter into that glory. If you sweat, like in the old, you know, if the high priest went into that holy of holies that once a year and he sweat, he died. If he brought one ounce of sweat, because sweat represents human efforts. God, human efforts cannot enter into the glory realm. God has an unceasing supply of oil for us. In the church age, we have mixed that oil of the spirit with the oil of man and religion. In the church age, it's by might, it's by power and the spirit. It's mixture. It's by might, it's by power and by spirit. That's why when Zechariah gets, when Joshua gets, gets removed those filthy garments and God brings a word and shows Zechariah the two lampstands and those unceasing supply of oil and those two olive trees. He asks him what this is. He said, what is that oil? He says, you don't know what this is? Notice what he says. And this is a kingdom word. He says, it's not by might, which is in the church age, my own efforts. It's not by power, which we do in the church age, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's why those that are led by the spirit, amen, are the sons of God. Those that are led by, the, led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. There's no mixture. We're in the time of the God removing the mixture of the flesh and spirit. And that is what you have to seek the Lord after. So when you're sitting in that alone time with the presence of the Lord, you begin 
your, 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 your body begins to change to become a living sacrifice for the Lord because you desire him, your body changes. And now you're presenting to the Lord your body as a, what? As a living sacrifice. Now Hebrews chapter nine and 10 can become a reality. Hebrews chapter 10 can become a reality in your life where Jesus said, here I am, Lord, coming to do your will, a body you have prepared for me. Here I am, Lord, coming to do all that you wrote in your books about me. Here I am coming to do your will. I said this before, Oswald Chambers writes in his book, My Utmost for His Highest, a child of God never has to ask what the will of God is. A child of God is the will of God. I didn't understand that in my early days in my walk with the Lord, but I understand it now. Good morning, Tony. Thank you for joining this morning. What I understand it to mean is that when I am one with the Lord, married with the Lord, I exist for only one purpose. My life is to demonstrate the will of God on the earth. My life is to be a reflection of Jesus' life who only came to do the will, the one who sent me. Jesus said this, as the Father sent me, so I sent you. Our sending was to be sent, not our own power, not in our own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why our words that we preach are not in a are not in the in the wisdom of man's wisdom, but they're supposed to be spoken in the power. And I hope that's what I'm doing. I'm speaking the word in the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. That this word that I'm sharing with you today, our spirit and life, and they're going to the depth of your innermost being, not to the surface, but to the depth of our being, because they're transformational, they're life changing, and they need to be, and they must be because that's what changes the church age wineskin into the kingdom wineskin so that we can drink the new wine of the kingdom. Now I wanna to go to back to Mark chapter nine again so that, that I can show you what this parousia looks like and you know, and how this glory is gonna be seen risen upon us because when we look at the, transfer, the, the Mount of Transfiguration, this is a prophetic act of the end times. And Jesus is going to talk with Moses and Elijah about end time purposes. And this is very important to, for us to understand that in the parousia, in that new wine or the new wine skin, the Lord must unfold his plans. The Lord must unfold his purposes. The Lord must unfold his desires within you as lightning. He's going to speak command words to you that he's going to release through you on the earth that is going to sound like thunder. The thunder shows you the, gives you the sound of the power that's speaking it. Praise God. I'm in Mark 9 and verse 2. It says, six days after this. I shared with, this, with you yesterday. Six days after what? In my early days. You know, when God began to draw me out of the church age to bring in, to give me kingdom understanding, I didn't learn it from men. I didn't. There are men who had it. Later, God added me to them, and then I saw that I wasn't crazy, <laughs> that God was showing them what God was showing me, and many of them were much deeper than I was in, the, in kingdom understanding than they still are. You know, I can only give you what God has given me and what's worked in me. I don't claim to be anything. I can only give you the light that I have that God has revealed to me, can I give to you? And I hope that it causes you to increase in the light as, as others have spoken into my life to increase that light within me. But it says, six days after this, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mount, a mountain apart by themselves. Did you hear what I said, faithful ministers? Hmm. How about just seven days to go up the mountain of the Lord? to be set apart like Peter, James, and John, to behold the Lord as the King of glory. Maybe a time where you can lift up your heads and allow the King of glory to come in, the Lord strong and mighty, Lord strong in battle, to receive the new plans, the new strategies, the new wine, the new software, the new apps, the new downloads, the new updates that you need to continue on your journey with the Lord so that you lead God's people upward together so that you can go forward with heaven and earth together as one with the Lord. 
Notice what he does. He took them on a high mountain. Who can ascend the mountain of the Lord? Psalm 24. Notice it's always going up. It's very interesting. In Matthew 10, when Jesus chose the 12, what did he do? He took them up the mountain, it says, that they might be with him. He took the 12 and he brought them up to the mountain to be with them. And then he chose them and then he sent them. Notice they had to go up before they were sent out. In the church age, we get them saved and we send them out and they never learn how to go up. That's what the kingdom, this transition is, is to restore that going up, come up here. That's what Revelation chapter one through five is all about, is to learn how to dwell with the Lord in the spirit, meet him in the air, where he can finish us in Revelation 1, 2, and 3. The message of Reven Revelation 1, 2, and 3 is change, repent, and overcome so that you can come up into the higher realm of God's glory realm in the third heaven and Revelation 4 and 5 to be formed into a kingdom of kings and priests of the Lord. I've said this that the first five chapters of the book of Revelation are where we are right now. It's the spiritual Pentateuch that prepare us for all the unfolding events that come after Revelation 6. There's a preparation of a people that will be overcomers, that will be able to sing. And so he brings them up. And on this mountain, we are going to see the parousia, the surrounding of the Lord. This is a prophetic picture to us of how God is going to lead us and guide us and show us the things that are to come in relationship. And that's why notice where he shows himself. Notice where he takes them to show his glory. He doesn't show it down here. He doesn't show it out in the forest. I'm sure there are places where the 12 of them were alone where he could have done this, but he didn't. He deliberately takes some of them, a people within a people, a church within a, a church. Why weren't the other nine qualified? Of course they were. This is a prophetic act. It's a prophetic word. It's a kingdom word to show us that out of the door, out of the daughters of Jerusalem, the Lord has a bride. The Lord has sons that will desire his kingdom and love him that he can take up into a special place of visitation with the Lord. This is a special place of visitation and habitation that's going to prepare them to become pillars in the kingdom of God. What they, this positioning, Peter, James, and John positions them that after the Lord dies and rises again and sends down the Holy Spirit, Peter, James, and John become pillars in the temple of God. I believe because of what they saw and what they experienced and this revelation, this experience prepared them for the greater glory of Isaiah 60. Thank you, Lord. Hope this is making sense to you. Amen. Praise God. Now, six days after this, why six days? Because from Adam to the year 2000 was six prophetic days. First Peter says a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. We've had six prophetic days, six days after this, which means there's a time after the sixth day that of transition as we enter the seventh day. We've been in that season for quite a while now, okay? But that door is about to shut. The six day do door is about to shut. And where we are when that door completely shut is going to determine our position for eternity. In Ezekiel 44, you know, the Lord talks about the sons of Zadok, their position before the Lord, okay? Because they stayed true to the Lord. They were the tribe in the midst of the, of the tribes of the Levites. And when people stopped giving tithe and offerings, okay, the Levites deserted themselves and they hired people to take their place so that they could take care of their own lives, their own ministries, their own finances. But the, but the sons of Zadok, one portion of that tribe stayed and they would rather die than leave their post. They didn't serve the Lord for money. There was a separation amongst the Levites of those that served the Lord for money. As long as they were provided for, they would stay and take care of the Lord. But in their absence, they allowed foreigners and strangers to come and touch the holy things of God, and that was not good to the Lord. And they get an everlasting judgment against them. They said, the Lord says, you're never going to be enter, enter into, you'll never be able to touch my, my holy things. I'll make you keepers of the gates. You can minister to men, but you're not going to minister to me. Only the sons of Zadok are going to minister to me. That's the remnant people. That's what Peter, James, and John are representing, those remnant people, those kingdom people 
and there are many, but not out of the multitude of Christians, there are a few that stayed on their post, that are staying on their post of seeking after the heart of God with every fiber of their being, loving God first, that God is qualifying, preparing to be full-grown sons and daughters of God, to walk in power, authority, and dominion that he had over the earth. When does this happen? Six days after this, he takes them, what, on the high mountain, apart from themselves, okay? And, and he was transfigured before them. That means he was changed before them. Why do this? Why show this? What does this have to do with God's end times and his parousia? This is a prophetic picture of glory. He transfigured before him. And I ask people this question, did he do this as a son of God to show himself as a son of God or to show himself as a son of man? And most people say the son of God. I say, no, he did not. He did it to show himself as the second Adam, as a son of man, of what the glory of God looks like when he fills the temple. Oh yes. Do you remember when Solomon finished the temple? What happened? The glory of God came and filled that temple. And what happened? The priests were not able to minister. They all fell upon their face because the glory of God was so glorious, they could not even minister. That's what the parousia brings. We felt that Sunday. I hope you got a chance to watch the gathering from Sunday morning on our YouTube, pan, our YouTube page, you know, or even on our Facebook page because I could not even minister. The parousia, the surrounding glory was so strong that I haven't changed from it. It's still lingering and I'm still staying in it and still abiding in it. And so are you because that glory is to remain. It's not to leave. That glory is to stay. That glory is to remain. That's what you got to understand. The glory remains because it's that glory that's going to transform things. Every place glory touches is changed. Every place glory touches is transformed. How is God going to change your family? By glory. How, how is God going to finish your children? By glory. How is God going to change the earth? By glory. That glory of his pure holy love. It's going to burn up everything that's not love, everything that's hindering, everything that's kept us in bondage. For this purpose was the Son of God made manifest. Look at he's being made manifest right here that he might destroy what? The works of the devil. And he's doing it by fire. Refining fire full of soap in us. But as that fire refines us, that fire comes out of us as glory transformational glory. The Lord told me 2020 was a year of transformational glory. I never expected it to look like this, but as I ended the year, now it made sense of what I saw at the beginning of, at the end of 2019 is now fulfilled at the end of 2020. God has done exactly what he said. And boy, what, what it took to get us there, huh? A pandemic, an election, all this stuff going on. All the suffering everyone's gone through, but the word of God says if we suffer with him, we'll be glorified with him. Now, this glory, he did this as the son of man, as a second Adam. This is what the glory looks like when it fills the temple. But that glory they had seen. He had, they had watched Jesus. They had been with Jesus. But now Jesus wants them to see something greater. He wants them to see this parousia. He wants them to see the glory that's going to be seen risen upon them. He wants to show them how it's going to feel, how it's going to change the atmosphere around them. That's why we become atmosphere changers. That's why what we're about to be released in and filled with and going with is going to pull down principalities and spoil them powers over nations. Why? Because of what we're carrying changes it. What we're bringing changes it. We don't change it. The glory of God changes it. Because where that glory is, the enemy can't stay over nations, over cities, over stuff. And God in that glory will execute his judgments and release his words of consequences to pull it down. Because we're going to be a glory-filled people, changed by that glory. From one degree of glory to another, as we behold that face as in a mirror, the, we who do it are constantly being transfigured. That's what the word means, transfigured by that glory, from glory to glory. As we wait in the Lord, like I shared with you this morning, as we minister to the heart of the Lord like we did Sunday morning, and the more we come, the more we get changed by that glory. The more that we come, the more we drink the new wine of the kingdom. The more we come, the more our wineskin changes. And as our wineskin changes, our influence, 
influence expands. God's influence, his glory, his territory that he trusts us with expands. He enlarges our stakes and expands our borders because we're carrying something. We're carrying that glory in an earthen vessel. Praise God. That's why this is a word of preparation for that glory. We must stop what we're doing and prepare people for it. Tell them about it. Show them it. Demonstrate it to them. Miracles and signs and wonders flow from that glory. I don't have to try to practice doing a miracle. You can't teach me how to work a miracle. Miracles flow from the glory. God does the miracles. God just positions us works through us and in us to release the miracles of glory, the healings of glory, the signs and the wonders flow. These signs shall accompany, right, them that believe. They accompany us because we're carrying that glory with us. We're walking in that glory, filled with that glory. The church is trying to work miracles in their own power and strength. God works miracles from his glory, in his glory. Heaven changes earth. Heaven's word changes earth. The atmosphere, the elements, a word can stop a storm. Peace be still. A word can cause a hammer to come out out of the ground in the days of Elisha, uh, out of the water, so that it can be returned to its owner. A word can cause fish to enter into a net and their nets break. That's the glory realm of the Lord. And what the Lord is doing, he's showing us his parousia. He's showing us his surrounding glory here in Mark chapter 9. His garment shone intensely white, and there was no fuller dress or bleach upon them. He shined. Arise, go up the mountain, and shine, for the light is come. And the glory of the Lord shall be seen what risen upon you. This is a picture of Jesus filling his temple. You are that temple. You're a temple made up of living stones being built up into a spiritual house for the Lord that you might show forth the praises of him that caused, called you out of darkness into his glorious light. That's why your body is the temple, excuse me, of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me end today's broadcast with spiritual software of the new wine. In this place, Peter, James, and John are going to be taken up into God's end time purposes. They don't understand it yet. John is fully going to understand it on the Isle of Patmoth. They don't understand. They're terrified because glory is terrifying. You fall on your face as a dead man, because that glory unfolds God's beauty and his holiness and his justice, his might, and his strength. The glory shows all of those attributes. The king of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord strong in battle. It is so powerful that it fills the land that God told Moses to take the shoes off of his feet for the place that he was standing is holy ground. That's how powerful glory is. Pastors, fivefold ministers, have you been able to say that? Have you heard God say that when you gather together? Everybody take the shoes off of your feet for the place we are standing is holy ground. Most of the time when I minister, if God ever invites me to go to a church or sends me to a church of ministry, I don't usually wear my shoes. Why? Because of the holiness of the Lord on that ground, right? Or if I have them, he'll say, take them off. And in the middle, I'll take them off because we're standing in a place of glory. Every need of our being is met in that glory realm. Every need of God's people are met in that glory realm. That's why the enemy loves us to stay in the religious form of services and structure and religion where we have a little bit of God's presence and a lot of flesh because that's the realm he can operate in, the, the realm of flesh and emotions. But when we come into the glory realm, we come into the realm of God's emotions, the way God sees things, the, God, the way God hears things. And he can't stay in that glory. That's why we got to make his glory our main function and purpose. And that glory is to be one with him. Oneness is glory and glory is oneness. Is this making sense to you this morning? I hope this is, I hope this is helping you this morning. I hope God is depositing 
his fire and his glory within the depth of your being. Now, this is really critical. This is where, when, when, the, when, when the Lord Jesus looks at his disciples and they ask him, why are you te teaching the people in parables? He said, I teach them in parables because their eye, they have eyes to see and they don't see. They have ears to hear and they don't hear. They have hearts to understand, but they don't understand. To them, I speak in parables, but to you, I speak the secrets of the mysteries of the kingdom. That is so important to, to, to you. It's to know the secrets and the mysteries of the kingdom. That's what the Lord is releasing right now. On this mountaintop, the Lord appears in his parousia. And in that parousia, heaven and earth meet. And Jesus talks to those who are in the third heaven, Moses and Elijah. This is a third heaven picture manifesting on the earth. This is a third day picture of the glory realm now being seen on the earth realm. And in that glory realm of this parousia, the surrounding of the Lord, Jesus is able to communicate with Elijah and Moses on the earth. Peter and James see it. Where is Jesus standing? He's still on the earth, isn't he? He's still in his earthly body, isn't he? And yet, in that glory realm, when that glory shines out and begins to fill the atmosphere around him, look what it does. It causes Moses, this is so powerful, and it causes Peter, James, and John to see into the glory realm of what Jesus is presently doing on the earth as he's speaking to Elijah and to Moses. Elijah, Elijah, and Moses. Elijah and Moses are two witnesses of God. They are two end time deliverers. They are two end time prophets of the Lord. I read a post this morning and it broke my heart that God says that God does not have old prophets today like the Old Testament prophets. That's just not true. It's just not true. Matter of fact, in Malachi chapter four, it says, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, he's gonna send Elijah the prophet. He speaks of the two end time witnesses as prophets of God. And what do they do? They release judgments and they release words of consequences just like the old time prophets do. So that's just not true. God is raising up deliverers for this hour and a delivering people. <clears throat> so I, I just don't agree with it. But anyways, it says Elijah <clears throat> and Moses accompany them. The Bible says there's not a greater prophet on the earth than Moses was of his days. Moses was called a prophet. We know Elijah was a prophet. So you've got these two prophetic ministers who have ministries of deliverance. Moses delivered people from Egyptian bondage, which is sin bondage. Elijah delivered people from the religious bondage. Both of those are God's end time work of delivering people from sin to be saved and from the religious bondage of the church age so that we can be a kingdom people set apart for the glory of God as full-grown sons and daughters of God. And notice what happens. He sees Elijah and Moses, and they're holding a protracted conversation with Jesus. And the Amplified says a protracted conversation. Why that word protracted conversation means it was a long conversation, which is a length of time. And I believe what the Lord is doing now is he's connecting us in that third heaven realm to see exactly what Peter, James, and John see, they see down here on earth, we are to see. That's, to me, that's proven in Revelation chapter four, verse one. Come up here so I can show you the things that are to come. And he saw a door standing open in heaven. And immediately, when he goes up through that door, he sees a throne. Immediately, he sees a throne. And he sees the activities of heaven when, when he goes up through that door, that is a divine position. That's why Zechariah needed to change his filthy garments of the church age and put on royal, royal garments and a new turban on his head so that he could walk in that place where John is 
where he could see in that place, where he could rule from that place, where he could reign from that place, where he could access to God in that place. That's exactly what Peter, James, and John are seeing. They're seeing the access into the glory realm of God, into the third heaven. And they see Jesus having a protracted conversation <clears throat> in heaven, you know, with them. And I believe, and I could be wrong, but they were talking about this day and this hour. And Peter, James, and John, who are not quite ready to understand what they're seeing right now, and Peter took up the conversation saying, Master, it is good and suitable for us to be here. Let us make three booths, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. How did they even know who it was? They never saw Elijah. They didn't know what Elijah looked like. They didn't know like it was Moses, but they knew, didn't they? They were able to discern by the Spirit who they were. Amen? And Peter says, for we did not know what to say, but they were violent, frightened, against with dread. In the midst of this picture, this revealing of God's glory, this picture of Jesus transfiguring is Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. A command from God to his people in his end times to be changed from water to wine starts with arise, go up, and shine. Arise from the prostration that your circumstances have kept you and shine with new life, it says in the Amplified. For your light, the light of the glory of the King of glory. Seeing the King of glory, Revelation chapter 1 has come. And now that glory shall be what? Seen. What do they, it isn't, isn't they, aren't they seeing it? Shall be seen risen upon you. That glory realm ties us directly into the third heaven with God so that the Lord can show us the things that are to come. He wants us to know. He wants us to see. He wants us to be prepared. He wants to give us understanding of the hour, the day, and the season. And he wants to keep us safe in the hour that's coming upon the earth, knowing what the Lord is doing, safe in the secret place of the Most High God, safe functioning as God's end time witness as on the earth, the reflection of his glory. He wants us to be able to walk in victory to victory to victory, kept safe as he was. No one could take his life from him. He said, I lay my life down. Nobody can touch me. The prince of this world comes and he finds no place in me. That's the finished work that's going to be in his bride and his overcoming people so that that glory can be seen risen upon them. Somebody say amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you're just joining us, I hope you go back to the beginning and you hear this whole broadcast. I got to wrap up now. I got just two minutes to wrap this up. Thank you, Lord. Now, this is important. As they're standing there in a glory, what comes? A cloud. The same cloud that came to meet the children of Israel on that mountain. When God began to speak out of that mountain, they fled and they went away. And they said, Moses, you listen to God. We will do everything God tells you to do, but we fear for our lives. And that broke God's heart. He wanted to have such intimate fellowship with them. He wanted to reveal himself to them as he revealed to Moses. And they rejected him because of their sin and their conviction. And they fled from him. But Peter, James, and John are taken up to a high place where they, they're afraid, but they don't run away. They said, it is good for us to be here. And that's what we should say. It is good for us to be here, Lord. Not run away from the glory. We need to run to the glory of God. And look what he says. And a cloud threw a shadow upon them. What cloud? The cloud of glory. The cloud that leads them by day and the fire that comes by night. And out of that cloud, they heard the voice of the Father audibly. They heard the audible voice of the Lord audibly. They were positioned to hear where they've never heard before. They were positioned to see, are you hearing me? Like they've never seen before. They were positioned to understand like they never understood. That is what the new wine skin is for. That is what the new wine brings. It causes you to see what you have not seen hear what you have not heard and understand what you have not heard, uh, uh, known before. And that's why the Lord said, I has not seen, Paul said, I has not seen, ear has not heard, or has it even entered the heart of man, the things that God has in store for those that love him. That scripture is being fulfilled in our ear right now. Thank you, Lord. And what did the Lord speak out of that 
glory. One command, the same command that Mary at the wedding said to the servants, to, to, to the servants about Jesus. Mary looked at the servants and said, do everything he tells you to do. And she walks away. She spoke prophetically to the servants, do everything that he tells you to do. And then Jesus told them and go get, take these six clay pots and fill them with water to the brim. It was a command word. He gave the command and then he gave a second command, draw some out and bring it to the master of the beast. And we don't know how it happened, but on its journey, the nature of that water changes to wine, just like it's happening with you and me right now. We're being drawn out right now by the Lord and we'll be taken to the master of the feast and on the journey, we're being changed supernaturally by the Lord. But listen to the command that Mary spoke. My, what Jesus said, woman, my, my, my time has not come yet. Why are you asking me? He, she ignores what he says, so to speak, and goes to the servants, do everything that he tells you to do. She knew. How does she know? By revelation knowledge. Do everything he tells you to do. Listen to what the voice says. The father's voice says to them on this Mount of Transfiguration. This is my son, my most dearly beloved one. Be constantly listening. Remember, there's a protracted conversation between Elijah and Moses, the Lord. Be constantly, and that's where we're coming in this kingdom, Weinstein, where we're constantly listening to and obeying him. If you loved me, you'll obey me and you will keep my commands. All of this is revealed to them in the parousia of the Lord. They are surrounded in the glory of God. They are on their faces Jesus is standing with Moses and Elijah in the glory. The, his clothes are shining. His face is shining like the noonday sun. They behold the glory in the temple of God. And that glory reveals God's end time purposes, plans and purposes. And the voice of the father says, be constantly listening to him and obey him. That is. Constant, oh, that constantly listening is what the new wine skin is, and the the drinking of the new wine is the power, the ability to obey and do only and exactly what the Lord tells you to do as a witness. And the gospel, of the kingdom, will be preached as a witness to all the earth from the spirit of prophecy, the testimony in Jesus, the seven spirits of God realm. Here on this mount, we see the third heaven manifesting on the earth for Peter and James and John to see, to hear, to know and understand and get a word, a direct command of the Lord. Listen to him continually and obey him that prepared them to be pillars in the temple of God. Peter, James and John, weren't they the pillars that the Lord established the New Testament church on? Look at how they were specially prepared to be able to rule and reign and be pillars for the rest of the body of Christ. And so shall it is, so shall it be now. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. I feel like the two men on the road of Emmaus. My heart's burning as yours. My heart's burning. And when Jesus came personally to teach these men on the road of Emmaus, what did they say after they had communion? They said, did not our hearts burn within us as he expounded the scriptures? That Jesus is here right now. Father, let our hearts burn as you expound the truth of your kingdom within us. I pray such a release, such an impartation, such a strengthening, such an enabling to each and every one who's watching this broadcast and to their families. Lord, strengthen us. And I pray such a release, a strengthening, a quickening, an acceleration of your spirit to cause these words to grow the same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead would quicken this word in our mortal bodies to become our life experience and our reality. Have your way, Lord. Strengthen us. 
I thank you for the spiritual impartation today, Lord. We've been changed and we're being changed and we're continually being changed from glory to glory. Open our eyes to see you. Open our ears to hear you. Open our hearts to understand and we pray, teach us your ways, O oh God, that we might know you. We know you, Lord, but we must know you better. We see you, Lord, and we must see you better. We hear you, Lord, but we must hear you better. Constantly listening, hearing, led by your spirit. Refine us like gold and silver. Bring forth your finishing work and completely bring forth your completed work, Jesus, your third day work and change us into that new wine of the kingdom. Let us be the new wine skins that can contain and drink the new wine so that we can see and hear and move and be as one with you upon this earth, a people set apart for your glory, a wheel within a wheel, full grown sons and daughters, a bride, a man child, overcomers, May we grow into the full stature and the height, which is nothing less than your personality. So Jesus, that your life would, could be completely seen in our lives. That your life would be seen and known and your kingdom would be demonstrated through a multi-membered body of full grown sons and daughters as a wheel within a wheel. And I'm trusting you, that's exactly what you're doing right now. Thank you for your strengthening. Thank you, thank you for your grace. Now to you who's able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think, to you be the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What a good word for us this morning. It wasn't just a word. It was a life transformational encounter with God. That's how I see it. I hope it blessed you. If we can serve you anyway, bless you anyway, please send me an email at go at flameoffire2007.org or you can write to Reverend Lynn, our administrator at admin at flameoffire2007.org In January, we're going to be starting a new school, okay, a teaching time on Zoom video of what I call strategic targeted prayer and, you know, the establishing of God's royal priesthood, you know, and uh, a school of the apostles and prophets of intercession and prayer in communion with the Lord, including David's tabernacle. So we'll be doing that in January. And if you'd like to be part of that time, um, just send me an email at go at flameoffire2007.org or, or at admin at flameoffire2007.org. We're going to teach some things about strategic targeting, praying, how to be sent out to your streets from the Lord, how to take what we're learning right here today and allow God to come to transform streets, cities, and communities, to give us the strategies and blueprints of what we need to do in those cities, as well as the bringing forth of the apostolic and prophetic in the area of intercession, ministry to the Lord, and releasing that upon the earth of what we just talked about. Hopefully we'll be doing that for those of you that wanna be partake of that, amen. I started the broadcast today thanking everyone, and I mean it, thank you so much for all of you that have been sending words of encouragement joining this broadcast. We so appreciate you, and I mean that. Thank you for watching. You don't have to do this every day, but you're coming, and I appreciate it, and that we can do this together in the Lord. I'm learning just like you. I'm no different. I'm no better. God is still working me. I don't even claim to be completed, but I know he's completing me like he is you, and it's an honor and privilege to be with the Lord and with you together, and some of you have asked, how can we sow into your life, and for that reason, I mention it because people have asked me, if I don't say anything, no one's gonna know how to do it. And as missionaries, we become, we are certainly dependent upon the Lord touching people. Not to give to a ministry, but to love us as people and love us as family and love us as, you know, the work that God has entrusted to us. Out of that love and that nitty together by the Lord, God has people that he wants to touch on our behalf to help us, just like he touches us to help others on their behalf. And I know God has people, I call it the Philippian church, that loved Paul so much, 
okay, that they not only sold once but twice and they continually took care of him, made sure that his, he had what he needed to live and to do the work of the Lord. That's what my prayer is. I'm not looking for monthly sponsors or supporters. I don't even ask for it, nor am I going to send you a thousand letters about it. But what I've seen is that God is touching people by that love, ministers, sometimes churches and ministries, okay, that they're being touched by the Lord to pray for us, encourage us, and sometimes so financially. And they ask me. So you'll see on our screen, okay, hopefully that Reverend Liz put it up there for you, how you can sow. We have a, a PayPal account. We have a website. If you go to our website, we have some free things for you. We have books of some of the things I'm sharing with you that are free downloads. We have music on there that are free. We also have a YouTube channel of music called Thomas Henry Falcon. It's completely different music. And if you need music to spend in the time of the Lord in intercession, you might want to check it out. All right. But, you know, thank you to those of you who are praying for us, encouraging us. I really, really, we really thank you and appreciate you. And to those of you that are sending finance, especially this time of year, you know, anytime's a big deal, but even now, because I know you have things to do and people are, may not be working with COVID. And so that's why each gift is so precious to the Lord and to us. That's why when Paul received that gift from the church at Philippi, you know what he said? That their gift was a sweet aroma to God. Can you imagine that God smelled their offering, their giving? He said, this is a sweet aroma to the Lord's nostril. And because God so received it, he released this blessing. And I want to release that blessing because I believe that those of you that have been sowing prayerfully, encouraging us and financially, that they have been a sweet aroma to the Lord as well. And Paul released this blessing, and I'm going to pray it for you too, that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, spiritually physically, emotionally, relationship-wise, financially. May God increase you. May that Joseph anointing increase you. May the Lord increase you in every way so that your basket, that you have enough and 12 baskets left over to give to others. Amen. I hope you receive that in the name of the Lord. Thank you so much. And today, if you feel led, God knows. And I said in the early broadcast, it has been such a time of prayer and trusting the Lord. So, some of you have really responded. Some of you have been touched by the Lord and responded and your gift has been exactly what I needed to take care of a certain bill. Isn't that amazing? Right at that moment. That's how timely your giving has won. And so I thank you for that. I thank you for those of you that are listening and obeying the Lord because you know that's, that's so sweet of the Lord and shows us the Lord's love so much, you know, that he would bring the right at the right time and you get that reward amen praise god that's so wonderful and we're all blessed together hallelujah well we love you thank you for watching this broadcast okay um hopefully um you know this has been a blessing to you i'm trying to see if there's any other comments on here amen thank you and thank you for remembering us thank you for loving us and we love you if we can serve you in any way we're here lord bless you now have a blessed day Bye-bye.